The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Or good evening. I welcome you all. So this is our second session. Uh, we have Amulya, uh, Mazhar, Rakesh, Srinivas. Hi to all. <clears throat> Just want to confirm, guys, you can see my screen and the audio is proper. Yeah, thanks for confirming, Rakesh. I can see people still joining in, so let's wait for the one minute and we can start our session. Right. I guess uh, to this point of time, all you guys have access to the AWS Mammon Council. So I suppose all you have accounts now. Okay. So till yesterday we had discussed uh, the global infrastructure that includes the regions, AZs, and edge locations. And we had discussed various factors that help us to decide which region is the best for us. So any questions, any doubts so far, you can just let me know so that we can uh, discuss our questions because I can see people still joining in. In the meantime, we can discuss our doubts. So any questions till yesterday? Any doubts, any inputs, anything you want to add? No? Okay. I guess someone has raised their hand. Okay. Um, so I'll just put you off the mute. What's your question? Hello. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, my question is that uh, we can create multiple regions on one OS. Multiple uh, regions. Multiple regions. regions and, yes. See, uh, a region is is a global location. It's a geographical location, right? So within the geographical location, we have data centers called AZs. Within the data centers, we have the servers running. On those servers, we have the virtual machines, and upon those virtual machines, we have the guest OS running. In case one virtual machine is failed, how we can transfer to load over the one region to another, in case the machine is failed? And there are certain... Uh, certain, uh, I would say, uh, features that we use like snapshots, yes. transferring the AMI. Using uh, the snapshots, we can uh, transfer or, or duplicate uh, our virtual machines from one region to another. That we can do. So once we move for, uh, forward, we'll discuss the concept of snapshot to get uh, an in-depth understanding of that one. Okay. Right. Thank you. Any other question, Mazza? No, thanks. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> All right. So uh, I guess uh, a fair number of people have joined in. It's time for us to start our session. <clears throat> now, to this point of time, uh, I expect and hope that all you guys have access to the AWS Management Council, and you are are good to go. Now, uh, the AWS Mammon Council or the account that you have signed in for performing the lab sessions, it is called a free tier account. Free tier account means that this account 
or the resources with, within this account is free for one year. But nothing comes for free. There are some restrictions and some conditions that you have to follow so that you have to give no or very less uh, amount of money per month if you're performing the lab sessions. So uh, once you sign up the free tour account, it's a trial account, it's free for one year, you can use it without any issues. But there are some cer certain conditions or restrictions that you have to keep in mind. So upon sign up, the new AWS customers receive the following easy to services. If you, if you just uh, highlight this thing, it says following easy to services for each month for one year. I repeat, so once you sign up for the free tour account, you get the following easy to services for each month for one year. First thing first, you get 750 hours of easy to running Linux RHEL as the LES TD.micro instance usage. Now TD.micro is an instance type. We'll discuss the different instance types and later on. But you can run 750 hours of Linux-based. Now these are Linux-based instances or TD.micro Linux instances for 750 hours per month. And that is applicable for the entire one year. If you perform the calculation, why is it calculator? If you perform the calculation, let's suppose if you have 31 days in a month, if you have 31 days in a month and uh, you are running the instance 24 hours a day, then it amounts to 744 hours per month which means for, for 31 days, if you run the instance, you're not charged for that, and this is for the entire one year. means that if you launch a Linux instance for the entire one year, you are not being charged for that. It is free. Now the same applies to 750 hours of easy to running Microsoft Windows Server T.micro instance usage. Right. And this is also the same thing, but the difference is that over here, instead of Linux, you have Windows Server T.micro instance type. The instance type is the same, but you have the platform was Windows. So you can run a Windows based instance free for the entire one year. So one Linux instance one Linux TD.micro instance, one Linux TD.micro Windows instance free for the entire one year. Plain and simple. Nothing, it's not a rocket science. So you have to understand that if you, so it is an early based model. For example, let's suppose, let's suppose you are uh, running three Linux instances, three Linux instances in that case, the 750 hours is divided by 3, which means that each instance can run only 250 hours for, for that month. If that one Linux instance out of 3 exceeds 250 hours, then you have a charge for that. Okay? So the billing is uh, per, for the hourly basis. So if you have multiple Linux and Windows instances running, you have to divide by the number of 750 hours. Divide the number of instances by 750 hours, and each instance can, can run for that amount of time. I mean to say that if you exceed 750 hours for any given month, because if you're running one instance, there's no way that you can run, you can exceed 750 hours, but if you're, if you're running multiple instances at the same time, it is quite obvious that you will exceed 750 hours of the time frame. In that case, you are being charged for that. Okay? So you have to be very cautious about the number of hours that you run your instances for. You get 750 hours of Elastic Load Balancer plus 15 GB of data processing. Now Elastic Load Balancer is used for creating a fault tolerant architecture. Right? So you have to ensure that it doesn't exceed 750 hours. 
you get 30 GB of Amazon EBS in any combination of a general purpose SSD or magnetic plus 2 million I.O. with magnetic and 1 GB of snapshot storage. Now EBS uh, is uh, a storage option that is used in confinement or it is used in conjunction with the inst instances. You can say EBS or the elastic block storage is the storage for your instances like C drive, D drive. So you get general purpose SSD or the magnetic volumes and you get 1 GB of snapshot. That's a backup of these volumes. Now once you move forward, forward you can get to know what exactly we're talking about. You get 15 GB of bandwidth out aggregated across all AWS services and 1 GB of regional data transfer which means within one region to region you can transfer 1 GB of data. Now these are some of the few, I would say few important free tier limitations. There are many but these are the main one that you should be concerned about at this point of time. As I move forward I'll, I'll let you know what's the free tier limit for each and every service that we will be discussing in the future going forward. Right. So these are the free tier limitations you have to keep this thing in mind. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, I have seen the people uh, they use their company accounts, their, their organization's accounts to perform the lab sessions. Please don't do that. Okay? Because it's your might be it's a client AWS account and if you mess around with this account and you might get caught. Right? So Amazon Web Services is giving you something for free. So why to mess up with your client's account or your company's account if you have something for free, you can you can do anything with that. Okay, so don't use your company's accounts or company's AWS accounts to perform the lab sessions. Go with the free tour account. Okay, it is good not to not to take the risk to perform the R and D. Okay, because anyhow, if you if you work on the client's environment, you will get the knowledge. But don't do any kind of R and D or any kind of uh, uh, research on the feature and services and uh, add to the, uh, the cost. Uh, Rakesh I.O. means for input-output which means these many input-output operations can, can, be, can be worked upon on the EBS volumes. Two million I.O.s is more than enough. You can't encounter more than this I.O.s. I.O.s means input-outputs how many input and output operations can carry on on a single EBS volume. Because for the database style applications, uh, your EBS volumes may encounter many random read and write operations. So for that case. Now, there, there are two reasons why I'm showing this, this free tour chart. First thing first, it is very important from the examination perspective. At least one or two questions, at least two questions come up from this free tier list. Uh, they will give you some, some, so many options and they will ask you which is free, which is not free. So what things are free, what things are not, you have to keep a note of it so that you can very well solve two or three questions that come up in the examination. That's my main purpose is show this, uh, this list. The second purpose of me of showing this list is you should know that what things you have for free, what things you have not, or what things you don't get for free. Reason being because I've seen that uh, people, they don't use their accounts wisely and cautiously and they end up paying 10,000 or 15,000 of bill per month and this happens. Uh, I had a student, now she, I don't know what, what mess that she did, she did. She opened an account, spent up many instances, spent up many EBS volumes, and she forgot to shut down the instances or shut down the resources and at the end of the month she incurred 20,000 of the bill that got debited from her account. So I don't want you to land up in, in that situation. So I'll tell you a few simple steps so that you can avoid paying too much of bill. Because as per my understanding, even if you perform high intensive lab sessions and if you work eight hours per day, you can't incur more than 200 rupees or 2 US dollars per month. 
Now I use the free tour account to uh, host five batches. Apart from your batch, I also take four more batches. I also do my self-study. I also do some research for the clients. I, I don't uh, incur more than um, two or three US dollars per month. So I don't think that you will go up to that point. So in, just in case if you're, you are exceeding this, that limit, you have to check that, that there's something wrong at your end. You're something doing something wrong uh, that is adding up, adding up to your lab cost. Now, I let you know how to create a billing alarm. So I'll just let you know the steps for you to incorporate so that you can, you can get to know how to create a billing alarm so that you can avoid having too much of the lab cost per month. I guess Mazar has raised the hand. Mazar, you have any question? Uh, sir, my question is, uh, what is the maximum size we can create on S3 object, on single S3 object? What is the maximum size of a? Uh, single S3 object. It's 5 terabyte. Oh, like uh, how come the S3 came into this picture? Because we're discussing the billing. I found the Because there is, I see the AWS account, S3 mm -hmm. That's why they are, I asked this question. Yeah, uh, see, uh, thing is, in the free tier account, uh, the limitation for the S3 is 5 GB. Okay. In the free tier account, the limitation for the S3 is 5 GB. You can't exceed more than 5 GB of, of storage. If you exceed that, then you have to pay for that. So for, for under the free to account, 5 GB is the maximum limitation you get for the S3. 5 GB, 5 gigabyte. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's move forward. So Mozart uh, asked a very good question. Uh, once we move forward, I'll discuss all all the uh, resources for the S3 bucket. You get the limitation of 5 GB which means that if you exceed the 5 GB of the free tool limit, you are, you are in charge for that. Now, let's see how to create a billing alarm. So I'll, I'll let you know uh, two or three important steps for you to manage your cost. Now, first thing first, let me just show you how you can see your billing alarms or how to see your billing. At the top right corner, you can see my name, Ron Arora. Once you go over there, just go to billing and cost management. Once you go to the billing and cost management, um, you can see over here that now right now I don't have an incurred any charges because I'm working as a contractor, so I get some some kind of free credits. Now over here, um, once you go to the billing and cost management dashboard, you can see the the monthly bill for the each service that you have used so far. Okay, and also you also get a monthly invoices on a monthly basis. Now let me show you how those invoices look like. So uh, those invoices are in the PDF format. You can refer to, to, to those uh, to those invoices just in case if you want to get to know that okay, what's the what's the breakup of your uh, what's the breakdown of your uh, the pricing of the lab. So let me show you the invoices. Give me one second. Okay, so this is how these invoices look like. So for each month basis, you will receive these kind of invoices. Now, this even if uh, you uh, you haven't uh, incurred any cost, even if it's zero rupees, still you'll receive these kind of invoices. Okay, so you can very well go to the billing and the cost management on daily basis and see that how much cost you're incurring, and you can very well see over here. And apart from that. At the end of each month, you will get this invoice. Now, once you go for to the billing and cost management, you can set something called billing alert or billing alarm. 
Now I, I have one right now, I just delete right now and show you in front of you then how to create that. This is the first step for you to ensure that you, not, you are not exceeding your monthly limit to perform the lab session because I don't want you to land into the situation where uh, thousands of rupees are debited from your account. So to work wisely, the first step is to go, go to the billing and cost management and it says your account is, so under alert and notifications it says your account is enabled for AWS budget. Set your first budget to monitor whether the actual or the forecasted charges can reach a threshold you define. From here, you can define that how what's your monthly budget. You now see, I'm not sure how many people are are, are married. So once you once you earn the income, you now you have you have the monthly budget. Okay, this is for the the tuition fee for my child. This is for my electricity bill. This is for my food bills. So you you have the budget. The same thing applies over here. You have to apply the budget that how much you have to pay for each month for for, for the lab session. Click on set your first budget and I'm not sure why it's not going to take me to the page. Hang on one second. Uh, it may just open it my AWS Mammoth Console again. So I just go to AWS Mammoth Console and I go into my name, go to the billing and cost management, and let me just click on this again. It's not taking me to any, any, okay, I think might be that uh, my account is, is a little bit different because it's a, it's a contractor account, so it's not allowing me, give me one second please, otherwise I will just uh, let you know another procedure to initiate the, the billing alarm, just hang on one second. Okay, let's go to the billing and cost management again. So I'll just open the Google Chrome to accomplish this task. Let's see if it works. And I go to, let me see if it works right now. It's not working. <clears throat> now the other way to set up the billing alarm is CloudWatch. So once you scroll down, you can set your first billing alarm. I'm not sure why it's not taking me to that page. The other way is go to the CloudWatch. CloudWatch you can you can track down. Once you go, let me show you how you, how you can access the CloudWatch. But that page would be using them. I'm only saying uh, your free to account. Uh, my billing is sixty eight dollars. Uh, I'm going on uh, see. Free to account doesn't mean that everything is free. You might have used some resources. I'm not sure wh when was the last time you used uh, used it or opened this account. Now, over here, uh, I just go to alarms, and these are my alarms created. Let me just go to my North Virginia. From here, I can screen a billing alarm. Okay, so uh, I just went to the CloudWatch, went to billing, I create the alarm. Now. For you, for you guys, you don't have to go over there. So under under the billing and the cost management, once you scroll down, you'll get set your first billing alarm. Now I'm not getting from my side. It, I was getting previously. I'm not sure why it's happening. Under the alert notifications, once you go 
and go under your name, click on billing and account management, and set under the alert, alerts and notifications, you have to set your first billing alarm. That is necessary. Once you click over there, it will take you, uh, you, you will have some options and it will, you, it, it will land you to this page, billing alarm. Create alarm, billing alarm. Now over here it says, when my total AWS charges for the month exceed, I just put five US dollars. Now you don't have the option for the Indian national rupees. Okay, so you, you have to convert that and see that what's the monthly, uh, monthly quota for the, in the Indian national rupees. I usually keep that as five US dollars, which is close to uh, five to thirty, or I would say three hundred fifty rupees, something like that. Right. So it's one dollar. It's if it's seven to seven rupees, so it's three hundred fifty rupees. Right. So if it's five US dollars, if my monthly uh, quota or the AWS charges for the month exceed for any given month exceed five US dollars, in that case, I'm saying send not send a notification to. I click on new list over here and I just type in my email address. Right. I type in my email address and I click on create alarm. Now it will send me a subscription link on my email address that I've typed in. So I just go to my email and I get this email. Let me check. It will, it will take some time for the email to come up. Whatever. Let me just refresh my Gmail account. Okay, so I can just go to this AWS notifications. I click over here and I click on confirm subscription. It says to confirm the subscription, click the visit link below. Now this is the SNS topic, the simple notif notification service topic that I've created. I click on confirm subscription so that I get this alarm or this alarm generates an email to me if my monthly bill exceeds five US dollars. So it says subscription confirmed. And now if it is go back to my, my console, you can see a green check mark at the left side of my email address. And now I'm done. So this is called the billing alarm. Please go for this one because so that you'll be notified if you exceed your monthly charges for your lab. So that's the first thing you have to take care about. So I'm, I'm, I'm just telling the strategies to manage your cost, your lab cost. Okay? Because you'll be working intensively to perform the lab sessions, you have to take care of the, all these kind of things. Right? Mazar, if you have any questions, you can type in because uh, I'm explaining. So if any questions, you can please type in. Okay. Now, once we um, set the billing alarm, the second strategy is, so that's the first strategy. That uh, Please create the billing alarm. The second strategy is delete your resources or wipe out your resources if you don't need them. Plain and simple. Any of your virtual machines that you run, any of the, of the instances you launch, any of the EB swarms you create, if you don't need that, just wipe them out. Simple. I follow the strategy whenever I perform the lab sessions. Now I might be running, I might be running some some of the instances in the back end, but that's quite okay. But try your level best that if any one of your instances are running, shut it down. Right now you see my my this thing is is clean. Now in the school times whenever we have the slate, we used to rub the slate to make it clean. It is the same thing over here. Have the policy that whenever you perform the lab session, once you are done, either stop your resources, the best thing is wipe them out, delete them out, remove them. Because if the resources keep on running at the back end, it will keep on adding the bill. It's the same thing. If you, if you keep your uh, air conditioner switch on without using that, it will keep on adding to your electricity bill. It's the same thing over here. So you shut down your AC or you remove your instances from the AWS console, it's the same thing. You don't incur any charges further. Plain and simple. Very simple strategy, but I've seen people never follow that. Why? 
laziness or procrastinate they pro procrastinate say okay I have 10 instances running I, I will shut it down in the evening and that evening never comes and at the at the end of the month they get a few uh, hundred dollars bill and their even evening is spoiled so please make it a practice create a billing alarm and whenever you launch any resources whenever whenever you're done with your, with your lab session please remove or wipe out or shut down your resources because anyhow you can very well for the other, other lab session you can launch another instance or any other resource okay that is the second strategy that you can follow the third strategy that 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 is quite useful uh, I'm not sure whether it can be useful for you but that that's what I follow I stick to only one region now you will see that my preferred region to perform the lab session is always North California. Now you might be wondering how does it make a difference? It makes a difference because now you can see that I switched from North Virginia to North California. These are the two instances running. I was not aware that these are running. So I just go ahead and shut them down or terminate them. Because today in the morning I was taking the lab session and I forgot to, uh, to shut them down. And this happens. Always stick to one region. Always. Why? Because it is easier for you to wipe out your resources. Because if you scatter your resources across all these 10 different uh, regions, you get confused. For example, let's suppose you have five instances running in North Virginia, 10 in California, 2 in Oregon, 3 in, in Ireland, 15 in Frankfurt. So if you spread across your resources, across regions, you will get confused and you might uh, leave one of the regions where your resources are keep on running. Now this is the same mistake that, that I did. I was working in North Virginia without even knowing that my instances are running in California. And this happens. This is a human nature because we tend to you know, forget the things very easily. Today in the morning I, I was just uh, showing the students uh, the, some concepts on the North Virginia region so always make it as a uh, make it as a practice stick to one region because it is easier for you to wipe out the resources if you stick to one region for example if I just go to AWS Mammon Council under the North California all these are the resources so if I perform the lab session for three hours at the end of the three hours I get to know okay I have the audience instance running I have the storage gateway running I have the cloud formation uh, running. So under the North California, I can wipe out the resources very easily. So if I scatter the resources, I scatter the resources across multiple regions, I may skip one of the regions, get confused, and the resources will keep on running at the back end. So stick to one region. Very simple formulas, uh, formula, but uh, very simple strategies, but the people don't follow that. And it is quite uh, discouraging. So first thing, create a building alarm. Second thing, wipe out the resources once your lab session is done. Third thing, stick to one region. Never, never, no, switch between different regions to perform the lab session because it will it tend to confuse you and you will not wipe out your resources efficiently. So I hope that these three strategies would, would help helpful for you. Please make a note of it and follow them. Uh, Mazur, uh, question is, what step can I do for the billing alarm? Mazur, I've shown you the steps. So you uh, you have to go under your account, go to billing and cost management. Right. So uh, once you go over there, you just scroll down, and under the billing, uh, under the alert and notifications, you will get a message. Create your first billing alarm. You click over there, and once you click over there, then you it, it will you have to follow along the steps where you can uh, show the threshold. So I've sh already shown you the steps. Okay, so this is how you can create the billing alarm. Yes, Mazar, you can do for your AWS account. Shirts' question is: If it terminate, uh, means we are our instance will completely gone right. Yes, Shirat. So whenever you if you terminate the instance your instance will be completely wiped off. 
Surely they're saying we will lost our work, what we did on a particular instance. In that case, surely you can stop it, stop the instance. You can stop the instance. If you don't want to terminate the instance, the other way is stop the instance. Even stopping the instance will will um, help you to manage your cost. Okay. But don't make the instance running. You can stop the instance in, instead of terminating that. Any questions, any doubts regarding these three strategies? Right. So the thing is, if something is is given us to free, it is our responsibility to use it wisely. Now, we, we should not get into this. If, if it's free, we can we can just do anything, because it is our responsibility that okay, we we use it cautiously, wisely, without incurring too much of the money. Uh, we should thank Amazon Web Services. Now they have given us a very good console to perform the lab session, and all these services and features that you can access, you can, you can very well access on the real-time scenario, day-to-day -day scenario. So um, there's no difference. The AWS Mammon console that you will see in your production environment is exactly the same that you will see in the free tour accounts. There's no difference at all. So we should be thankful to the Amazon Web Services that they have given us these kind of capabilities for free. It is also a marketing strategy because Amazon Web Services, they want to you know, uh, make more and more people familiar with this technology. So we can take a, the best benef benefit out of it without incurring too much of cost and using this capability wisely and cautiously. So that's the whole point. Mazda is saying this at this message when I go to create Mazda, what's the uh, message you're getting? I'm just putting you off the mute right now. So uh, you can just let me know what's the what's the message you're getting. Yes, Mazda. Uh, sir, uh, I go to this, then the message is uh, I click on the your account is enabled for AWS budget. Set your first budget. We will use yeah, you click message. on that one. Mm -hmm. Set your first budget. I will click. Then there is 0 0.00 INR is the shown, the figure. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Even I'm clicking on this link. It used to work before. Today is not working. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's working for other people or not. Uh, the other thing is that you can go over here is if you just go to the AWS Memorand Console, go to CloudWatch under Management Tools. Uh, you can go for AWS. Uh, it is working for Rakesh. I'm not sure. Uh, today it's not working for for few accounts because because it was working before. Yeah. See, uh, Mazur. Uh, there's there's some 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 problem because it's not working for me as well, but it's working for other people. It's not working for some, for more the more of the people. So uh, you, what you can do is just go to the CloudWatch under Management Tools. Go to CloudWatch under the Management Tools. We have something called CloudWatch. The CloudWatch I was. Okay, so you are there. Uh, you clicked on the CloudWatch? Yes, yes. Amazon CloudWatch service, North Virginia. It's okay. It's okay. On the left Creative, side, do you see? Create a bring alarm. Yeah. You need to click over there. Uh, they said when my total AWS charges for the month, I will enter five. Yes. And, and down below you have to type in your email address. Yes, yes. And once you receive the email, you have to confirm the subscription. Okay, sir. That's it. So guys, uh, for other people, uh, if the link is not working, you have to go to the CloudWatch. Under, on the left side, you have this thing called billing. From there, you can just create your billing alarm. That is the second way out. So uh, I think it's uh, Mazur is working for you. Yes, sir. No, I work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Sir. All right. 
So that's about the creation of the billing alarm. Now let's move forward. So uh, these are all the three strategies. Now, let's uh, start with our some te technical concepts because now we have talked about the, some basic things. Let's discuss uh, the concept called EC2. What's an EC2? If I'm saying EC2, EC2 stands for Elastic Compute Cloud, and EC2 is the core and the foundation of almost all the AWS services. Okay, EC2 is the virtualization technology of Amazon Web Services. So let's discuss the EC2 in depth and get to know what exactly this EC2 means. EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud provides the scalable computing capacity in AWS Cloud. You can scale your entire architecture up or down based upon the patterns of the incoming traffic, time of day, and demand. Now this is based upon the principle of elasticity. Now this is a very important point, please make a note of it. In the interviews it is asked elasticity, what is that? Elasticity means that you can grow or shrink your entire architecture based upon the patterns of the incoming traffic, time of day, and demand. I repeat, the elasticity means that you can grow or shrink your entire architecture based upon the patterns of the incoming traffic, time of day, and demand. In other words, you can increase or decrease the number of virtual machines in the AWS cloud based upon these three factors. Let's take an example. Let's suppose that uh, you have an e-commerce platform and uh, you have uh, 10 instances running normally, right? In the normal situation, you have the 10 instances running. Now, what happens is that as the Christmas comes, as a Diwali comes, you, think, you see that there's a high, high spike in the traffic for, for your website because more and more people, they come to a website and they buy the items, they order the gift items. So on the eve of Christmas and Diwali, you can automatically increase the number of instances from 10 to 20. Automatically, because uh, based upon the traffic load, based upon the time of day, it will automatically shoot the number of instances from 10 to 20. I'm just giving an example. Now, once the Christmas season is over, once the Diwali, Diwali season is over, you will see the, the, the traffic spike is back to normal. Then, the AWS will automatically switch your 20 instances back to 10. So, this, is, this principle is called elasticity, which means you can any time increase or decrease the number of instances based upon these factors, incoming traffic, time of day, and demand. Opposite to elasticity, there's another kind called scalability. Scalability is, is not uh, applicable on the AWS, but uh, in the interviews they ask you, what is the difference between the elasticity and scalability? Scalability means you add more resources to the existing servers. Elasticity means you, you increase or decrease the number of instances. Scalability means that you add more resources to your existing uh, servers. For example, you have the servers. Uh, it has uh, a 10 GB RAM. It has, um, uh, let's suppose, uh, 500 GB of uh, hard disk. So using the elasticity, if you think that this server is not taking up, is, 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 it needs to take too much of load, you can increase uh, the number of GBs from 10 to 20. You can increase the, the hard disk from uh, 500 to 1 terabyte. Scalability means that you are adding more resources to existing servers, existing machines. Elasticity is quite opposite to it. Instead of increasing the resources of your existing servers, you are increasing the number of servers. Elasticity means go big but don't go wide. That's a difference. Scalability is quite opposite to elasticity. Elasticity means you can increase or decrease the number of instances, whereas scalability means that 
add more resources to existing virtual machines or existing servers. Scalability never applies to, to AWS. AWS strictly follows the principle of elasticity. And the service through which the principle of elasticity is followed is called the auto-scanning. This, this is the main uh, and the code service that uh, follows or that implements the principle of elasticity. So this elasticity is a, is a principle, but it's being applied using this auto-scanning concept. Right. Now, the EC2 is a pay-per-use model, which means that you pay only for what resources are being utilized by you and the number of instances. See, it is, it is more kind of, you can say, electricity-based model. Now, you are being charged based upon the units of electricity you consume, right? You are never, never charged for the, for the entire electric, electricity substation setup. Now, you are being charged for the number of units you consume. It is the same thing over here. You are being charged for the hourly or yearly basis. Most probably it's an hourly kind of model. So you have to pay per, it's a pay per use model. You pay only for what resources are being used by you. If you shut down those resources, or if you, if you remove those resources, you don't have to worry about the billing. Okay? So it's the same thing. When you shut down the AC or when you shut down the fan, the number of units uh, is reduced because now it, it stops over there. It is the same thing over here. No huge upfront cost. EC2 eliminates the need for you to invest in huge upfront cost involved in purchasing the hardware. And you don't have to purchase the hardware. There's no need to buy the routers, switches, servers, cables, get the rack space. There's no need for you to buy the buy the hardware. You can deploy your applications in just few simple clicks and you can launch as many virtual servers or instances as you want, configure their security and networking, and manage storage. Okay, so this is the fundamental of the EC2 or the Elastic Compute Cloud. Now I'll just make you familiar with, with some of the terminologies. You can write it down. If I say EC2 instance, or if I say instance, whether I say EC2 instance or instance, instance means it's a virtual machine running in the AWS cloud or VM. And EC2 instance or instance means that I'm referring to a virtual machine running in the AWS cloud. Plain and simple. Right? Any questions, any doubts, till now regarding this concept? Please feel free to ask. Okay, Mazur, you have a question? Yes, mother. What's your question? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, mm -hmm. The difference between the elasticity and the scalability. You mm -hmm. mentioned the elasticity may shrink incoming traffic, time of pay and demand. So mm -hmm. This is the elasticity, and what is the main difference between elasticity and scalability? See, the difference between the elasticity and scalability is elasticity means that. Uh, the number of instances is increased or decreased based upon those factors. Yes. But the scalability means that uh, instead of adding more instances, we can add more resources to the existing servers. Yes. So that's the only difference. Yes. Uh, I, uh, in free time, can I see this PDF to PPT of this? Model is elasticity and scalability. 
at free What's time. Speaking? At free time. Yeah, you, you can see that. These topics. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, mm -hmm. the, this you can save on the drive. It is, it is already been saved. Yesterday I gave you the link, it, it's already been saved over there. Okay, in Google Drive. Yeah. Okay. You can get that over there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's move forward. And let's discuss another uh, another terminology is AMI. What is an AMI? See, before I can start, what is an AMI? Uh, let's suppose that today I give you a physical server, a laptop, a desktop, any physical machine in front of you and say, hey, uh, could you please install Windows, Linux, Mac, OS X, or any kind of operating system on it. You have to have some, some kind of USB drive, a CD-ROM, a flash drive, and you can very well install the operating system on a physical machine. Right? Now today, if, I'm say, if I say that please install the operating system for your virtual machine, what's the solution? Because a virtual machine is running in one of the remote data centers that you don't have the reachability up to. Now, if you have to uh, spin up a, a virtual machine or an instance in Northern California, you will not go to the Northern California data center and install the operating system for the virtual machine. You have to have some kind of package or solution for you to install the operating system, the application and services for your instances. Therefore, we have something called AMI or Amazon Machine Image. AMI stands for Amazon Machine Image. Now your EC2 instances are designed around Linux and Windows operating systems. Now these instances that you launch in the AWS cloud, they are built from Amazon Machine Image or AMI templates. What is an AMI or Amazon Machine Image? It's a complete package that includes the operating system, additional software, and services required to build your virtual server in the cloud. See, AMI contains your operating system, services, and software that you need to boot your instance. Let me just go back to the AWS Maven console. Now, whenever you launch your instance, whenever you try to launch your EC2 instance or a virtual machine in the AWS cloud, the first step that you have to pass through is the, the, the choosing of AMI. So uh, I click on launch instance over here. The first step is choose an Amazon machine image or AMI. It says an AMI is a template that contains the software configuration, which means the operating system, application servers, and applications required to launch your instance. So this is a package, it's a template that contains your operating system, application server, and applications required to launch your instance. It's a complete package. Now, AMI or the Amazon Machine Images are of two types. Either they can be Linux-based or they can be Windows-based. The base operating system can be either Linux or Windows. Now these are the few AMIs to choose from. These are different AMIs. Now, uh, for example, uh, this Amazon Linux AMI, Red Hat. Now, the one you can see uh, with, with gray, free to eligible, these AMIs, you can use that with a free to account. Okay? Because they're free. Otherwise, if you choose any other AMI, you may be charged. So the one which are, which are saying free to eligible, they can be used with a free to accounts, with a free to AMIs. So, for example, um, if you scroll down, I have this Microsoft Windows Server 2012 R2 base. Now, with each AMI, you will get a unique AMI ID. For example, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting over here, AMI B8C5BCD8. Now, this is another flavor of 2012 R2, but it is with SQL Server Express with another AMI ID. Another flavor of Windows Server 2012 with SQL Server Web. 
Another flavor of this, it's SQL Server Standard. Windows Server 2012 Base. Windows Server 2012 with SQL Server Express. Windows Server 2008 R2 Base. So these are the different flavors or different uh, types of Windows Server's AMIs to choose from. Right? You have Ubuntu, Amazon Linux, for, for the, you have different Linux distributions, Red Hat, SUSE, CentOS. Right? Now these uh, AMIs that you can see over here, they are called the public AMIs, which means that any person can use this AMI to launch his instances from. Right? On the left side, you have something called My AMIs. If you see my cursor, My AMIs. My AMIs is a space where you can create your own custom-built AMIs and save them over here. Now, believe me, you will never use these AMIs. You will never use them because in your company, you will have your own custom-built AMI that will contain the operating system, either Linux or Windows, and it will contain your own set of applications and services that you want to run on your instances. So, once we move forward, I'll show you how to create your own custom-built AMI. AWS Marketplace. Now, AWS Marketplace is a, a, a kind of a space that belongs to trusted vendors like SAP, Zend, Microsoft, and various vendors. Now, these vendors are selling their own custom-built AMIs. Right? For example, uh, I go with Alert Logic. Now, Alert Logic is a very popular intrusion detec detection system. I click on this one, and I can see what's the billing model for this AMI. Now, these are all paid. You have to you have to you have to pay for that. These are not free. So, for example, I go with this AMI Alert Logic Log Manager AWS, and uh, this is a uh, Linux-based AMI with a 64-bit architecture. I can get a free trial for, for 30 days, and once it is done, this is the hourly basis for the instance types. So they, for per hour, there's a software cost, and there's an instance cost. And, and the total for, for the Steven.micro instance type is 0.185 US dollars per hour. Okay? So these AMIs are free. Now, if you want to explore more, just go to the site aws.amazon.com. aws.amazon.com forward slash marketplace. Now, this is where you can explore a ton of AMIs from different vendors. Right? And you, you, can, you can search them depending upon the categories on the left side. For example, if you're looking for a WordPress, just click this type in WordPress in the search bar and type enter. And now you have uh, the WordPress power of Bitnami, Animoto. Okay, so there are different uh, flavors of the WordPress given by the, by the different vendors. For example, let's go to WordPress Power of Bitnami. Now, WordPress is a very uh, popular uh, blog platform, and also uh, millions of websites have been created by the on the WordPress site. So it is based on Linux, Linux, Ubuntu, and these are the charges for the AMIs depending upon the instance types that you choose to run your uh, this AMI. Okay. So that's about the AWS Marketplace. Underneath you have something called Community AMIs. Now what's a Community AMI? Community AMI uh, is a community effort which belongs to now the AWS developers across the world. Even if you can create your own AMI and post them over here for free or you can, you can include a charge for that. So it's a kind of a free view where different people, different developers create their own AMIs and they can post them over here for free. Right now, we have 46,722 AMIs. Most of them are free. Some are, some are being charged, are being paid. Okay? 
So these are the different AMIs to choose from. In the quick start, you can see all the different public AMIs. In the My AMIs, you can store your own custom based AMIs. In the AWS Marketplace, you can shop for or you can buy some, some uh, popular AMIs from some trusted vendors like SAP, Microsoft, Zend, Cisco, Checkpoint. In the community AMIs, you can uh, get some AMIs for free or they are charged, they have been charged and uh, these are being shared by different teleports across the world. It's a community effort. Okay, so that's about the AMIs. In a nutshell, an AMI is the operating system of your machine, of your virtual machine that contains the operating system, application services, and application server bundled together in a package. Okay, so that's about the AMI. Any questions, any doubts, let me know. Uh, so the, uh, the format of the AMI is .AMI. Uh, Sandeep, it doesn't work with the VMware. Uh, it doesn't work with the VMware. It's a .AMI format. Uh, Sandeep, uh, virtualization types are the different virtualization. Uh, now these, uh, they're uh, HVM stand for Hardware Virtualized Machine. Right. So these are different virtualization types. Okay. Hardware virtualized machine. So most of them are um, HVM. Okay. Any questions regarding the AMI? Is this concept clear? Please let me know. I'm just pausing for a, for a while. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, guys, just give me a second over here. In the meantime, you can just uh, let me know if you have any questions. Sorry about that. Any questions and doubts? Let me know. Right. So right now, what, I, what I'm trying to do is that I'm just making you familiar with, with the basic concept so that we can you know, start launching our virtual machine on instance from scratch. The next topic that we will will cover is called the security groups. That is the firewall of our instances. Through the security groups, we define what kind of instance, what kind of traffic can reach or leave our instances. So we are saying, is Amazon support multiple virtual virtualization type? Uh, so uh, as per my understanding, we don't have to worry about what's the virtualization type, right? Because uh, these things are written on the AMI. So at the back end, Amazon may support multiple virtualization types, but it's nothing of our of our concern. Okay, it assures that anything that we we are choosing should be compatible. But as per my understanding, most of the AMIs that are uh, being available are labeled as HVM. Okay. 
because at the end, um, on the server end, they're using Zen as a hypervisor. Now, apart from that, what kind of virtualization type? It can be a para virtual or a hardware virtualized machine. It's not of our concern because uh, the thing is the AMI should be compatible. The kind of operating system that we're trying to launch should be compatible. The application services that we want to run should be compatible. Okay, because virtualization layer is completely taken care by the by the AWS. Okay, we don't have that much to say or insight into that. Okay. So guys, uh, we have some lengthy topics coming up. Security groups will take some time. They will discuss the key pairs and eventually we'll launch our first instance. Let's do one thing. Let's take a, a, a dinner break or lunch break, depending upon what, what time uh, zone you're in right now. Let's take a, some break. Once we are back, we'll start with our security groups. We'll cover the key pairs, and then we'll just launch our first EC2 instance. All right? Uh, so let's take a break for, let's say, 20 minutes. It's 9.40 uh, by my time. Uh, please be back by 10 o'clock and then we'll just continue with our conversation. All right? So it's a break for 20 minutes. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back. I guess all people are back now. All right. So well, let's uh, start. <clears throat> all right. So let's move forward. <clears throat> Until now, we have discussed the concept of EC2 AMI and the billing norms uh, and how to manage our bill uh, lab cost for the AWS Memory Council. Now, we'll discuss our next topic that's called the security groups. Security group is the first step to ensure that you have the, the best or the right security in place to secure your virtual machine or the architecture. So what is a security group? It is an AWS firewall solution that filters the incoming and outgoing traffic from an instance. So it controls uh, what kind of traffic can com come in or go out from an instance. Now filtering is done based upon these three criteria. IP protocols, ports, and the source and the destination IP addresses. These are the th th three different criteria based upon which your filtering is done. And it requires X.509 certificate and key to authorize changes. That's one thing. Let's go to the AWS Memory Council and see uh, how it works. Right now, uh, I'm on the first step, so I'll just browse through this, uh, the second step real quick uh, where we can see the security groups. So the security group is at, uh, at the sixth step. Now, over here, the step six says configure security group. You can see the definition over here. A security group is a set of firewall rules that control the traffic for your instance. Right? Now, there are two ways that you can apply the security group to your instance. Either you create it first and apply it by clicking on select an existing security group and choose the existing security group in the list over here. Or you can create a new security group and create the security group from scratch right now while launching the instance. So these are the two ways that you create the security group. Now, after that, so once we click on, uh, right now, what we'll do is this week we click on create a new security group and we'll, or we will create a new group from scratch that will be applied to this instance. Now first thing first, you have to assign a security group name. Now this is a random name. Now, this is a random name that uh, you can choose for it or, or I would say that Amazon is saying, can, can you please tell the step again for new instance? Mother, you have to go to the EC2, uh, and from there, click on Launch Instance. Okay. So now over here, uh, under the security group name, you have to type in, uh, let's suppose, uh, I'll just name it as Web Server S3. That stands for security group. Under the description, you can type anything for the documentation purpose. So, so I'll just type in this, security group is for all web servers. Now while launching the instance, this dashboard that you get for the security group, here you can define the inbound rules or, the tra or how to control the incoming traffic. Now this instance that I'm launching right now, this is a Linux-based instance. Linux, now for the uh, people who are working on the Linux, you use the SSH, or we use the SSH or Secure Shell to get the root access to our remote Linux machines. Now over here, by default, you can see over here, it says SSH, let me just take a pen, SSH, now SSH stands for Secure Shell, that is used to uh, get remote access to your Linux machines. Now SSH always communicates over TCP port 22. That is static. You can't change that. Or there's no need to change that. SSH always communicates over port 22. And the source, now you have to select the source. 
source means from which IP you want that this IP, the source IP can initiate the SSH access to this Linux instance that you're launching right now. As if now you can see the source is anywhere. 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0.0 slash 0, which means which means any instance across the internet can get the root access or SSH access to the Linux machine, which is not recommended because you will never ever give the root access to your machines to any any IP. Right? You can see the warning message. It says rules with the source 0 .0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0.0 slash 0 allow all the IP addresses to access your instance. We recommend setting security rules to allow access from known IP addresses only. So you have to be very cautious while setting up the uh, rules. Now for uh, the root access, especially the SSH for the Linux, you can choose my IP. Now this will uh, pick your laptop's IP right now. Now this is the IP address that I'm getting right now, which means that I'm the only one who can initiate the root access or the SSH access to this Linux instance, right? Or I can choose a custom IP. For example, uh, let's suppose 56, or I can uh, define a complete IP address range. Now this IP address range belongs to my office where my administrators sit. So these administrators with, uh, with, the, with any one of the IP addresses can access, can get the SSH access to this virtual machine. Right? So this is about giving the root access. Now you can add as many rules as you want, it's up to you. You have different protocols, ports, for example, uh, so you have this uh, TCP rule, UDP rule, ICMP, all traffic, SSH, DNS, HTTP, POP3, IMAP. Depending upon what kind of application and services you're running or you would be running on this instance, you can add multiple rules. By default, you can add up to 50 rules in any security group. Okay? Now, let's take a scenario. Let's suppose that um, let's suppose that you take that this is your this is your AWS cloud. Within this AWS cloud, this is your instance. Now this IP 189.69.145.0.24 it belongs to your corporate office. Now this belongs to your corporate office and you want that these people with this IP address range can get the SSH or the root access to your instance because these uh, uh, people sitting in your building uh, will perform day-to-day -day administration and maintenance tasks. So this is your AWS cloud and they, they can get the, the root access to this instance. Now, Opposite to it, there are some other users who want to send some kind of web traffic across the internet because might be on this instance you have some web application or a web server running. You might be hosting a WordPress site on this Linux instance. So these people can across the internet can send the HTTP and the HTTPS traffic. HTTP and the HTTPS traffic. So over here, what I'm trying to accomplish, the thing I'm trying to accomplish is that the root access should be with my, should from the known IPs, whereas the HTTP and the HTTPS access can be from any one of the IPs. Therefore, if I just exit out erase this drawing, I would say that the SSH access I'm giving to only the known IPs, and this Linux instance can receive the HTTP traffic and the HTTP is traffic from all the IPs, which means it can receive the HTTP and the HTTP is web traffic from any one of the sources across the internet. 
so that these people who are sending the web traffic can browse the web servers, the browser pages on this website, hosted on this Linux instance. Right? So that's about the defining the rules for your security group. Okay, it is always advisable. Now, if the, let's suppose if this was my Windows machine, then the the root access can be given through the RDP. RDP stands for Remote Desktop Protocol. I repeat, Remote Desktop Protocol. It's a default protocol to get, get to get remote access to your Windows server or Windows machine remotely. So since this is a Linux, I would be I would be choosing my SSH. If this was Windows, I, I, I had chosen the RDP. So RDP and the SSH acts <coughs> in, a, in, a, in an ideal situation. RDP and the SSH access should be given only to known IPs, whereas uh, the web traffic, HTTP and the HTTPS uh, can be entertained from all the IPs. Because through the SSH and the RDP, you're giving the root access to Windows Server. So you have to be very cautious while choosing the source IPs. Now this uh, rule that I'm creating right now, this is for the inbound traffic. Once I launch the security group, then I can define the outbound traffic over here. Okay. Okay, Rakesh uh, is saying, what do you mean by root access? Uh, Rakesh, root access means uh, getting the access to the server. Root access means that uh, through the um, SSH, if I if I allow the SSH access from all the sources, any person get, can get the access um, uh, to the uh, command line of my Linux instance. You can get the access to the uh, to the shell, and you can perform any run any commands. No, no, uh, Sandeep, I'm not talking about the root or admin access. That's a different thing. Root or admin access means I'm talking about the server access. See, I'm not talking about the about the admin level or the user authorization level. I'm talking about that that person will get the access to your server console, the command line. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, Rakesh, 182.69.144.0/24 means that uh, up to 256 IP addresses can access this machine. So it will go as 184, 182.69.144, 45.1, 145.2, 145.3, 145.4, up to 145.255. So this complete range of 256 IP addresses can access can get the can get the SSH access to my Linux machine. All right. Any more questions, any doubts regarding the rules or other things that I've discussed so far? So security groups is is purely for restricting or allowing the access from the known IPs, and you have to choose what kind of ports and the protocols you want to open. Okay. Any questions or doubts let me know. Now once you create the security group, now I just exit from here. Once you create the security group or once you launch your instance, you can access your security groups under the easy to dashboard and once you scroll down, you have instances, you have uh, images, down below, you have the under networking and security. You have the security groups. Security group. Uh, this is a dashboard of the security group from where you can manage your all the security groups. You have to keep one thing in mind. Security groups are region specific. Region specific means that the security group that I created in a region can be applied to the instance only in that region. Now this is EC2 security group I've, I've created in the North California. I cannot use the security group in any other region at all. It is not supported because my security groups are specific to a particular region. For example, this is my entire security group dashboard for the North California. If I just go to the North Virginia, 
you will you will see that uh, I will have only few. The console will, will be completely different. You can see on that, that I will have only so these are these are other different security groups over here. In the North California, I have much more. So a security group created in one region can be only used in the confinement of that region. You can't surpass that. Under the security group dashboard, you can select and you can edit the inbound and the outbound rules. By default, all your instances allow all the outbound rules, all the traffic. So I suppose if I just choose this one, let me just give me one second. Let me choose uh, this security group. So these are the inbound rules from for the security group. Now each security group has a unique security group ID. It's, it looks like SJD053E2B4. Now these are the inbound rules. From the from this dashboard, I can also manipulate the outbound rules. By default, your security group will allow. <coughs> the access to all the destinations. It says type all the traffic, protocol all, port range all, destinations 0.0.0.0.0, which means any of the IPs. You can also manipulate and you can restrict your outbound traffic as well. So a security group is the first and the most important step to ensure the security of instances where you can define the inbound and the outbound rules and you perform the filtering of the traffic based upon the IP, proto IP ports protocol and the source IP addresses or the destination IP addresses. Okay. Now, Shrikanta is saying whether this will cause issues during the case cause of replication. No, Shrikanta. Uh, it will not cause any issues. It is just that you have to create a duplicate security group in another region. Now you can't import that. There's no capability that's been given that you can import this kind of thing. But yes, you can create duplicate security groups in other regions. Rakesh is saying, are there any business case where we need to edit inbound and outbound traffic? Rakesh, it's very simple. There's nothing called business case over here. The thing is that if you have a server running, as an architect or as an administrator, you would be allowing or you'd be restricting some kinds of traffic. It is as simple as that. There's no business case that I can discuss over here because it's, it's a very simple thing. And uh, in your companies, you work on the firewall rules where you allow or deny some kind of traffic depending upon your architecture. So it, it, is, it is the same thing over here. Okay. So upon the security groups, I can't create the entire business case. Business cases are, are, are much vital, where you have to incorporate or you have to involve so many components under one hood. Okay? So it's completely server-based. As an architect, as an administrator, you have to decide which traffic is best to reach your, your uh, instance, which traffic is best to, uh, to, be, to go outbound from your instance. So these security groups, uh, these security groups are completely under your hands and the configuration is, is extremely simple. But yes, you have to be very cautious so that any kind of unwanted traffic doesn't, does not reach your instance. Okay. Sandeep is saying security group rules are applied to the instance which we create or there's some gateway server in AWS before it reaches the instance. Uh, Sandeep, uh, I would say that uh, let's not get into the gateway uh, configuration as of now. We have the gateways called Internet Gateways, Virtual Private Gateways, Customer Gateways, but that's a different story. Okay, So in the broader perspective, we use something called Access Control List. We'll discuss that later on, but right now we're just going small. It's starting from the, from the scratch. So once we move forward, we'll discuss other security uh, components like Access Control List, IAM, policies, and all those kind of things. Key pairs. And the gateways never work on the security settings. Gateways only allow the VPC access or your cloud access to, to different networks. So at the broader level, once we move forward, we'll, we'll, we'll check the access control list, how it restricts or allows some kind of access to our cloud.
So let's move forward. Now let's discuss another topic called key pairs. Key pair is a second step towards security. What is a key pair? Now, um, I'm not sure how many guys you have, um, or you might have seen this in the banks, uh, in the banks where you have the lockers. Once you go to, to, to any one of your bank where you have the locker, you put your own key, unlock the locker, and the bank official will use his own key to unlock the locker. So if the both key pairs match, your locker is unlocked. And you can take your items or gold items or any kind of cash or any kind of valuable items from the locker. It's the same thing over here. We use a key pair, a public key and the private key to give you, you the authorized root access to your virtual machines. So let's discuss this key pair. Amazon EC2 uses public private key cryptography to encrypt and decrypt the log information. Over here, the public key encrypts a piece of data while the recipient uses a private key to decrypt the same. And this combination of public and the private key is called a key pair. Now, I'm not going into the slide right now, but I'll just show you real quick that how it works. I go to EC2 and I'll just uh, no, uh, go to the last tab, last step where I will just launch an instance. So I'm not uh, I'm not discuss these points right now. I'm just going to the, to the last tab where I can show you that uh, where the key pairs are being generated. Okay. Because right now I'm just discussing the concepts. I'm not discussing the configuration aspects as of now. First thing first, my, my intention is to make your concepts clear. Now the key pair is a second step to ensure that there are the best security policies in place to secure architecture. Now, in the key pair, there are two keys, public key and the private key. Public key is one that the AWS stores. It says a key pair consists of a public key that AWS stores. This public key is embedded into the AMI of your instance. is coded into the AMI or the Amazon machine image of your instance. So this public key is the one that the AWS stores in its AMI. Whereas the other key that's called the private key file is the one that you store on a local machine. Right. Um, now once I go to the last tab, last step, Either I can choose an existing key pair. I have some key pairs that I can I can I can choose. I can create a new one, or I can just proceed without a key pair. But without proceed without the key pair, it will allow me to launch an instance, but I will not be able to connect to it. In order to get a successful connection to my instance, I have to choose any one of the two above options. Either I have to choose an existing key pair, or I have to create a new one. Let's do one thing. Let's create a new one. So I just name it as web server test dash kp. Now these key pairs are in the .pem format. Uh, I just write it down to make it more understandable. It's in the dot, dot .pem. I don't know the uh, the full form of it, but uh, it's in the .pem format. PEM, private key file, right? So what I would do right now is I just go ahead and download the key pair. I click on this option, download the key pair, and this will download this key pair on my local machine right now. Now, this is the key pair that's been generated. See? This is the key pair. Now, it's, it's a kind of an algorithm. Um, 
Now the same algorithm works uh, in your banking transactions, the public and private key. So what I will do right now is, let me do one thing, let me just remove this, exit out. Uh -huh. Let me just exit. Okay. Now let me show the key pair how it looks like. So it is being saved in my downloads folder. Uh, I'll just drag and drop that on my desktop. Now this is my key file. I have to rename that in the .pm format. So this is the key file, the private key file that I have to save on my local desktop machine in order to access this instance in the future going forward. Fine. This private key I will save on my desktop whereas the public key is embedded into the AMI of this instance. Once this public and the private key pair is successful I will be logged in to my instance. I will get the root access or the access to the instance to perform my day-to-day -day administration or the maintenance tasks. Okay. Okay, let's move forward. Over here, the public key is embedded in your instance or in, into the AMI of your instance, whereas you have the private key to sign in securely or generate a new password. Instances created for the public AMI use the private, public private key method to sign in. Whereas if you're using a customized AMIs, which means you have your own AMIs, then this uh, concept of public private key is not mandatory. You can skip this step. And how the key field file is generated? Now these are generated automatically when you launch the instance. You can have as many as you like to the keep your dashboard. Now you can manage your keys by uh, going to the keep your dashboard. So if you just go back to your AWS Maven console, under the EC2 dashboard, if you scroll down, you can access your key pairs from here. Not access means that you can you can just know uh, have a look at what, what are the key pairs and these are the fingerprints that are associated with each key pair. One thing you have to keep in mind that the key pairs are region specific. Now uh, you can you can you, you can import that. That's a different thing. But once you create a key pair, they are region specific, which means the key pair that you create in a, a key file that you create for a region cannot be used in any other one unless you import that. Okay, so for example if I just go to North Virginia over there uh, I'm not sure whether I have the key pair or not. I may have one or two or three or four, not that much because I don't access the North Virginia. So I, I have these many uh, key pairs. I can click on import key pair and I, I can import the key pair from here. Okay, so it's saying you have inserted the, the private key, please insert the public key. Because uh, it is, it belongs to another region, that's why it's not allowing me. So the key pairs are region specific, it can be only used for the resources within that region. Okay. And these key pairs allow the, I would say, it gives you the authorized access to the instance. Once we launch the instance, I'll show you that what's the, what's the, how the key pair works, how we upload that. It will, the key pairs will help us to get the root access to a Linux instance, whereas for the Windows one, it will create or generate a, a first time login password. So uh, 
if you talk about the key pivots, we get the root access to the links on Unix instance via SSH, whereas for the Windows instance, the private key is used to retrieve and decrypt the initial administration password. Once we launch the key pair, I'll, I'll show the entire procedure. But as of now, we can understand that a key pair is give you the authorized access to the instance, whereas the public key is being kept or embedded into the AMI of the instance, whereas you store the private key in your local machine. All right. So that's it. Any questions, any doubts so far? Because now I just go ahead and launch my uh, EC2 instance. I'll show it step by step procedure. Any questions, any doubts regarding the concepts that we have discussed so far? So we have discussed the EC2, AMI, security groups, and key pairs. If you have any questions, please let me know because now we'll just go ahead and launch our first instance. I'm not sure how many people are here from Delhi. I guess Mazar is from Delhi. Uh, there's a huge <laughs> dust storm that is going on right now because um, um, the monsoon season is, is almost here. But right now there are many strong winds that are being blowing up. So I can, I can very much hear the crackling of the windows, doors, and, and uh, there's a kind of a dust storm that's going on outside. Any questions, any doubts before we can just move forward? No? Okay. I think it's time for us to go ahead and launch our first instance. Now, I'll just walk you through the step-by-step -step procedure and explain to you almost each and every step that is being involved in launching an instance. Okay, so please make note of some important steps or important concepts that I may be discussing because that is very important from the for the exam from the examination perspective. Okay. So let's move forward. Now I'll just go ahead and click on uh, EC2 under compute. This says virtual service in the cloud. EC2 stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. I click over here. Now this is this entire thing is called EC2 dashboard. It's called EC2 dashboard. Now over here, uh, I can see that I have no instances running, and I can see the Elastic IPs, dedicated host, volumes, key pairs. Uh, load balancers, blah, 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 snapshots, and all those kind of things. Now, I'll just go ahead and click on, now, before I can just launch the instance, I have to ensure which region I've chosen. So, I'm the North California. On the EC2 dashboard, uh, this is the region I'm, I, I have chosen, so I, I can verify over here. So, I'll just go ahead and click on launch instance. Now, the first step over here is to choose an Amazon Linux machine image or AMI. Uh, right now, I'll just go ahead and choose a Windows Server AMI. So I'll, I'll just go with the Microsoft Windows Server 2012 R2 base and click on Select. Now these are the instance types. What is an instance type? Instance type is a reflection of the underlying hardware resources. Right? For example, uh, this Tetra Micro contains one vCPU, one gigabyte of memory, and all those kind of things. 
I'll discuss the instance time in detail, but you, you can relate with an example set because it's a kind of you can say the 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 virtual or the hardware specifications of your virtual machine. Like we have, we whenever we uh, buy any laptop or a desktop, we see how many how much RAM is there, how much disk space is there, how much gigahertz of processor is there. Fine, it is the same thing. It is the kind we can say the physical or the hardware or the specifications of your instances. Based upon what kind of applications or the resources you'll be running, these are the different instance types for you to choose. For example, if you want to, if your applications are compute hungry, you have to go for the compute optimized instances. If your uh, applications require much more memory, you'll go with the memory optimized instances. If you if you are if your applications that you'll be running on this instance they require so much storage space, you go go with the storage optimized instances. Fine. Depending upon what kind of application services you would be running on this instance, you have to decide that which instance type suits you the best. For the free tier account, T2 Micro is the preferred instance type because it is it is a free tier eligible instance type right I choose this one and I click on configure instance details now this is where the real action begins over here I have to define some tenancy levels networking attributes and all those kind of things First thing first, I'll define the number of instances that I want to launch from this AMI. As of now, I just go with one instance. I can just type in two. In that case, it, it will launch two instances. But I'll just go with one right now. You can see over here, launch into auto scaling group. Uh, auto scaling group we'll discuss later on. Auto scaling group uh, is a logical collection of identical instances. We'll discuss that later on. So I don't want this instance to be binded to any auto scaling group as of now. It should be independent in nature. Plain and simple. I choose a number of instances as one, and now I can go with the purchasing option. Now I haven't discussed the purchasing option as of now. This instance that I'm launching right now, it's an on-demand instance. On-demand instance means that I will be built at the hourly basis which means that I will be billed per hour. So I'll uncheck this option. Spot instance means you can bid for the unused capacity. I'll keep this option unchecked because I want to keep this instance as on demand. I'll just read it, write it down. We'll discuss the pricing models later on. So it's called the on demand instance. On demand. Which means that I would be billed by the hourly basis for this uh, running instance. So I'll keep this pricing model as it is and I move forward. Now I have to choose the network. What is a network? Network means I have to choose in which VPC or the virtual private cloud I should be launching my instance into. Once I choose that, I have to choose something called subnets that are associated with different AZs. Now, what what on the earth we're talking about? Because right now we are we are discussing all about the AMI security tools, where the network has come in the picture. I'll explain with an example. Uh, I think one second. See, let me just uh, explain an example to make it more understandable, or I just create a diagram to make it more clear.
I'll just open Word document. So if I say that uh, now that please go ahead and launch an instance in a region. Right. How are you gonna get to ensure that okay this is the exact region and the exact data center where you're launching your instance into? you have to have some kind of logical mapping or an address to ensure that your instance or the resources are launched into the correct destination. For example, today I, I invite you that, okay, please come to my home, we'll have some coffee, cup of tea, so I invite you. So I, I'm saying that, okay, I, I look at in Delhi, India, so I say, okay, Delhi is so big, what's your exact address, right? So based upon the address will reach my home. It is same over here. When I say that I'm launching my instance in a region, I'm actually referring to a thing called VPC or the Virtual Private Cloud. This in this region of North California. Hang on one second. So in this region of North California, I have the VPC created. That's called the Virtual Private Cloud, which has an IP address range, for example, um, 172.16.0.0. So that's 16. When I say that launch your instance in this region, you have to have some kind of logical mapping, right? In that case, you choose a virtual private cloud with an IP address range. Now, this is called the CIDR block, classes inter domain routing. You choose the entire range of the VPC associated with that region. Now inside the VPC you have something called subnets. A subnet is a block of IP address ranges within which you launch your instances into. This is my subnet A. And this is my subnet B. This subnet A can be associated to my availability zone A and this subnet B can be associated with my availability zone B. Why I'm doing that? Because if I say that please go ahead and launch your instance in this AZA, how are you going to get the logical mapping? You will choose the subnet associated with this with AZA. Right? Within the subnets, you launch your instances. These are the instances. And these instances get the IP address from the subnet range. For example, this subnet A can have the IP address range like 172.31.0.0. Slash 24. This subnet has IP address range 172.16.0.0 slash 24. Whatever it may be, it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say over here is, or I'm sorry, so, okay, I'm sorry, so it will be zero over here. So what I'm trying to achieve over here is that I want to ensure that I have the logical mapping and I get to know that where I'm launching my instance into. If I'm saying region, I have to pick what, which VPC is that. If I'm saying AZ, I have to pick which subnet is that. This is how it works. So I have to have some kind of network or a logical map to launch my instance into and define that okay, this is the VPC, this is the region, this is the virtual private cloud that is associated with this region, and this is the subnet associated with my, this AZ. 
over here, if I just go back to my AWS Maven console, I'm choosing. So if I just go go to my EC2 dashboard, I click on Launch Instance. I choose my uh, Linux with this Microsoft uh, Windows Server AMI. Go over here. I choose my VPC and I choose one of the subnets over here. Right. So over here, what I'm trying to ensure is that each subnet is associated with, with a different AZ. You can have multiple subnets in a different AZ, but over here, I have one subnet on the top with, with, with US West 1B and another subnet associated with US West 1C. Okay. So this is how I create a network of resources are within this, within this VPC or the virtual private cloud I launch my instances into. I can choose no preference. If I choose no preference, the AWS will, will pick any one of these subnet and launch my instance into it. Okay. So I have to choose a virtual private cloud to launch my instance into. Uh, Masur, I'll just take a question later on. Once, once I'm done with this, I'll just take a question. Okay. Now, once I uh, select the subnet and I ch once I choose a VPC and I select the subnet within this one, it's time for me to select uh, the auto assign IP. I'll just keep it as enable because I want to clear, assign a public IP to this instance. IAM role. IAM stands for Identity and Access Management. Now, uh, from this, we can decide that what kind of service this instance can access within the AWS cloud. I'll not stress upon that right now because that's a different topic, so I'll just keep it as now. Shutdown behavior. Shutdown behavior can be either stop or terminate. Stop means I can stop this instance, I can start it back again. If I terminate this instance, I kill this instance, I can never get it back. So I just choose the shutdown behavior to default that is top the instance. Enable termination protection. So the next step is enable termination protection. I, I can check mark this option. Which means that any of my architect or administrator who is handling this account would not be able to accidentally terminate this instance because if the instance is terminated, it's been wiped out. Instance termination, instance termination means that you are killing this instance, your entire data, your entire virtual machine will be wiped out. You cannot get it back. So you can check my this option so that no one can do that by mistake. Because uh, the 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 even if even someone someone tries to terminate the instance by mistake, the action will not be accomplished. Now comes the monitoring. What is a monitoring? Now you, you have to make a note of it. This comes in the certification examination. Now by default, all your resources or almost all the resources are being monitored under, under the CloudWatch, by the CloudWatch. CloudWatch is the default monitoring tool of your AWS. It it uh, monitors everything. It mo monitors the performance of your instances, volumes, database instances, Redshift clusters, everything. Now, CloudWatch comes in two different flavors. I'm just typing in CW. CW stands for CloudWatch, this one. It comes in two different flavors. The first flavor is called the standard. Now, this is an examination question that comes up. Please make a note of it. Standard also means default. It is the same thing. Under the CloudWatch standard or default monitoring, your resources are being monitored after each five minutes. Which means after each five minutes, the CloudWatch will, will check your resource and get the, the, the statistics of it. Whether it's a CPU utilization, disk read operations, disk write operations, network in, network out, and all those kind of things. The CloudWatch will make the API call to your instance after each five minute, get the stats and the data. 
this is the standard or the default monitoring and this is for free. You are not charged for that, even for the business accounts. This is the first flavor. The second flavor of your CloudWatch is detailed. The detailed, uh, it, uh, it is also called enhanced. Detailed or enhanced monitoring. Now, in the detailed or enhanced monitoring, your resources are being monitored after each one minute. It's a one minute frequency, one minute. So it is a highly intensive uh, um, monitoring where the CloudWatch will monitor the performance of your instance after each one minute, which means it's a highly intensive where the CloudWatch will make the API call to your instance after each one minute. That's called the detailed or enhanced monitoring, and this is not free. This comes for a price. Standard one is free. That is default. The detailed or enhanced monitoring is not free. It is a one minute frequency and you have to pay for that. This is a sure short question that comes in the examination. Now, by default, each and every instance would be monitored as the standard monitoring. If I check mark this option, it will be detailed monitoring. If I keep it unchecked, it will be standard. So I keep this as simple as standard. I would not go for the detailed monitoring because in that case, the additional charges would apply. Next important thing is called tenancy. What is a tenancy? Tenancy are of two types. The first tenancy type is called shared tenancy. Sorry. Shared. What is a shared tenancy? Shared tenancy means that, let's suppose this is an HP or IBM box. This is an HP, IBM, or a Cisco, or a Dell server that I just purchased from the, hot, from the market. Or I would say that this is the physical box or a physical host server that is that has been running in the AWS data center. Right? Because right now, I would not be running any of my resources in my data center. I would be using the AWS own data center. Now, if I choose shared tenancy, shared tenancy means that upon this physical host running in the AWS data center, these are the different virtual machines running. These different virtual machines can belong to different individuals and organizations, which means different individuals and organizations can run their virtual machines on the same piece of hardware, on the same physical host. This virtual machine can belong to Accenture. This can belong to uh, Wipro. Even if they are rivals in the IT industry, now they, they have to run their instances in a shared environment. This can belong to SCL. This can belong to JP Morgan. Shared tenancy means that different individuals and organizations are running their own virtual machines on a shared piece of hardware on a shared physical host. Now they don't have uh, they, they don't have the transparency for each other, but at the back end their virtual machines will be running on a shared platform. That's called the shared tenancy. Now this shared tenancy is free. There's no charge for that. The other options that you can choose is called the dedicated tenancy. Dedicated tenancy means that you book the entire physical host. You say Amazon Web Services, this is an HP or IBM Dell box. This is mine. I'm booking that, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you extra charge. Please ensure that all these instances are mine, which means that I own this physical host and I'm the only one to launch my virtual machines. I will not be allowing any other individual or the organization to run his or her virtual machine in the same physical host because I own this. Right? This is called the dedicated tenancy, this one. 
dedicated. And nothing comes for free. If you go for the dedicated, additional charges will apply for the dedicated tenancy. You have to pay additional charges in case you book the entire physical host and that physical host will be owned by you and you would be the only one to launch your virtual machine or the instances into that dedicated host. Right. So these are the two tenancy types, shared and dedicated. So shared is free, dedicated is chargeable. Next I move forward and uh, this is the default network interface that is being uh, applied over here. I don't, I don't need to change this right now. So these are the settings that I have to, I have to choose under the configure instance details. Any questions, any doubts till now? Let me know. So that I can just move forward. So I guess all the things are clear. VPC, subnets, uh, tenancy, uh, your cloud watch monitoring. I guess we have a question right now. Uh, Rakesh is saying under some it is saying 4091 IP addresses. It, it means that Rakesh 4091 instances can be launched in this subnet. Each one IP can be assigned to each single instance. So 4091 instances can be launched in that subnet. Shurat is saying how they're managing the public IPs. Shurat, uh, AWS, they manage their own pool of public IPs. Uh, I'll discuss the, the concept of public IPs and elastic IPs in detail later on. But the, once this instance is launched in a default VPC, it will automatically get a public IP, which will change if I stop this instance or restart this instance. Rakesh saying how we arrive at the number of IPs under subnet slash 20 slash 24. Rakesh, uh, once we cover the VPC, we'll discuss in detail. So uh, we have to network or design our entire network uh, by ourselves. And we have to choose our own IP addressing scheme. So based upon that, we'll discuss that whether we are going for the slash 20 CID range or slash 24. So it's, it's completely up to us. So once we uh, discuss the virtual private cloud, we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, Mazur, I'm just putting you off the mute because uh, you have some question. Yes, Mazur, what's the question? Hello. Yes, Mazur. Sir, we can give the add IP to the network interfaces to subnet 9.8. <laughs> Because they are yeah. given auto assign. We can give yeah. also add IP. Yeah, we can add a manual IP. Okay. We can add a manual IP from the IP address range of the subnet. Okay. We can do that. We can add a manual and IP, a manual private IP from the subnet range. Yes. And also we can choose if the choose instance type on the second option. Uh, I choose T2 micro pre tile eligible. Yeah, yeah, you have to choose. Can that. I, I not choose this one T2 dot nano? But that will be chargeable. Okay, chargeable. Yeah. Okay. Thank Any you. other question, Mr. No, thanks. Yeah, thanks. All right, uh, so that's uh, all about for the configuration details. Let's go ahead and click on Add Storage. Now, this is this root volume that I'm assigning right now. This will act as a C drive for my Windows instance. By default, for the Windows servers, you get a 30 GB of root volume. What is the root volume? 
Root volume is a volume that contains the program and the operating system files of this of this virtual machine that I will be launching right now. I can increase, I can keep it as from 30 to 100, it's up to me. I can go up to 16, uh, I can go up to 16 terabytes. But I'll just, care, I'll just make it as 30 GB by default. These are the three different volume types I discuss in detail once I cover the EBS or the Elastic Block Store. Now this is called the EBS volume, Elastic Block Store. Okay, we'll discuss that in detail later on. IOPS means input output performance, which means uh, how frequently the random read and write operations I can encounter on this volume. One important thing, delete and termination. This is, if I uncheck this option, if I uncheck this option, even if I terminate the instance, I can recover this volume and get the entire data out of it. I'll discuss in detail once we cover the EPS. Now let's suppose if this is my this is my EC2 instance. This is my EC2 instance. I have now this volume is attached to it. This is my entire volume, the root volume that is attached to it. If I uncheck this option, this one, in the cases if my instance goes down or it terminates, I can still recover this volume and the entire data on it and I can attach this volume to any other instance. Right? So we'll discuss all these, uh, all these things in detail once we cover the EBS. But just give, me, give you an FYI. So uh, I check this mark option, delete and termination, click on tag instance. Now tagging means you just uh, add a tag value. So uh, I name it as uh, web server. I click on configure security group. Now this is my Windows instance. So uh, I just name it as Windows. I just create a new security group. Windows server SG. I just copy and paste the same thing in the description. Now uh, since this is a Windows instance, I'll get it, I'll allow the RDP access from, I'm sorry, RDP access. Now RDP by default, it communicates over TCP port 3389 and the source would be my IP. Let's suppose if I'm, I would be launching my WordPress site on this Windows instance, I would be allowing the HTTP traffic and HTTPS traffic from all the sources so that the people can access my web website using these protocols. HTTP it communicates over port 80 whereas the HTTPS it communicates over port 443. Right? So I define the inbound rules for the security group. Click on view and launch. I can view all the options. So if I want to change anything I can just click on edit because once I surpass this thing I can't change the settings. Rakesh is saying where the, where is the option in the EC2 to, to opt for EBS or the instance Mac ephemeral instance. Uh, Rakesh, um, uh, that's a good question. You get that option once you cl click on add more volumes. But yes, uh, it all depends upon the instance types. Not all the instance types uh, uh, support the ephemeral or the instance store volumes. Okay. So once you go to the uh, window where you uh, you can add once where you choose the storage, add storage. You click on add more volumes. From there, you may get the option to choose the ephemeral storage. Mazar is saying, in which type, which can choose rule? Uh, uh, Mazar, uh, if you're talking about the security group rules, it all depends upon that what kind of application you will be running. For the Windows one, I've allowed the port 3389 from my IP and port 80 and 443 from all the sources. So I review all the options. I click on launch. Now it says choose an existing key pair or create a new one. I create a new key pair and I just name it as web server windows dash kp. And I click on download the key pair this will be downloaded in my downloads folder. You can see this. 
and I click on launch instance. I think I did something wrong. The thing that I've run, done wrong, I always do that. I might have chosen the dedicated tenancy, which is not supported in the free tour account while explaining you. I, I always do that. So I'll just go back to the shared and launch my instance. Now it says your instance are now launching and this is the instance ID. So once you launch your instance you get a random generated instance ID. I click on this one and this instance is in pending status which means that it would take a while for this instance to be up and running. Once it is up and running in the status checks over here, over here I just get two by two checks. Right now you can see it is initializing. So once I get two by two checks, it is I will be good to go to access my Windows instance. Now right now this instance is launching. It will take a while. <clears throat> Once I scroll up, uh, I can see all the details associated with this instance. This is the instance ID. Uh, this is the instance state is running. Instance type is tg.micro. Now this is the private DNS and the private IP. Now this IP it is it has got from the subnet range within which it is launched. Private IP is mainly used for the internal communication and it never changes. This is the virtual private cloud or the VPC ID with which it is launched. Now opposite to this, I also got the public DNS and the public IP. Now the public IP is purely used to make your to make your instance publicly or accessible from the internet. Now the private IP is mapped to the public IP at the back end using this concept called NAT or network address translation. So the public IP is making my instance publicly accessible from the internet. If I don't have the public IP, I cannot access my instance at all. all right? Now, uh, once I do that, uh, I can see my availability zone, US West 1B, security group. I click on view rules so I can see all the rules that I've applied for the security group where I've allowed the, the 3389 RDB access from my IP whereas the port 80 and 443 access is from all the sources. Now I, just, I can click over here, Windows Server Security Group and I can manipulate my inbound and the, and the outbound rules. By default, my security group will, will allow all the traffic to all the sources to all the destinations. I can also apply the rules over here, but I'll just keep it to default as it now. So let me just go back. And um, this is the Windows AMI ID. The platform is Windows. Uh, it's the own now. This is my account ID. Uh, this is the launch date and time. Okay. Now this is the uh, the device name of the root volume. 30 GB assigned to it. This is the default network interface ETH0. There's a subnet ID. Now if I just go to the status checks, it is right now you can see initializing, monitoring. Now I was talking about the CloudWatch. Now right now you can see that these, these graphs are blank because the instance has not worked or launched really right now. But over here, once the instance is up and running, you can see under the CloudWatch console, all the performance criteria or all the performance uh, attributes of my instances, whether it is CPU utilization, disk reads, disk read operations, network in, network out, disk write operations. I can check the performance of my instance in the graphical format. Okay. So right now it's launching right now. Let's wait for this instance to be launched. Oh, 
Okay, so now I've just got two by two checks. This is, I'm getting two by two checks over here, you can see over here. Two by two checks, which means that I am now good to go. Okay. What I will do is, now I'll just go ahead and connect to this instance. Now, right now I'm using a MacBook. It, it has an OS X uh, as its operating system. So, uh, I will be using a third-party software called Microsoft Remote Desktop. I'll, I'll show you some, a different procedure for the Windows one. So, the people who are using Mac, uh, you can download this Microsoft Remote Desktop from the App Store for free. So, right now, I'll just create a new connection. So, I'll just name it, uh, name is as Windows Server. I'll copy and paste either, either this DNS name or the public IP of this instance. So, I'll just go ahead and copy and paste the public IP. I can also copy and paste the public DNS. So, I'll just go ahead and paste the, the public IP over here. Uh, hang on one second, please. Now, I need to get the user ID and password, but I don't know how to get that. Choose your Windows Server, either right click, click connect, or choose over here and click on connect on the top. Over here it says username is administrator. I copy this one and paste it. In the password it says get password. I click on this icon. Now it is saying please choose your key pair. So this is being saved on my, okay, give me one second. I have to go to my downloads, rename it in the .pm format and save that on my desktop. So, I click on choose file, I go to my desktop and choose this key pair. It, it copy over the entire contents. Now, I just go ahead and click on decrypt password. This is the password for me to sign on to the Windows server. I right click, copy it, and I paste it over here. So, this, this creates my connection on my Mac, I just go ahead and click on this Windows Server and try to connect to it. So right now it's connecting. Let's wait. Okay, you can see the screen is loading up now. Okay, so I'm logged into my Windows Server 2012 instance. This is my Windows Server. I've connected to this instance over the internet connection. Right? And it's been launched. Now, I have, I've got access to it from my Mac PC. Now, I suppose most of you guys are using Windows, so I'll just show you how to connect from the Windows. So, I have a Windows virtual machine running, so I'll show you the procedure from there as well.
Okay, uh, for the windows, uh, hang on one second, let me exit out. Okay, let me just open my Windows Memory Console. Now this is the Windows 10 I'm working on right now. I click on sign on. Now, uh, I just go back to my EC2 where my Windows Server is still up and running. And I go to my Windows instance. Now, I hit connect over here. So you have, you have two options. Either you click on download the remote desktop file, it will download a remote desktop file over here for you to connect. Right? So you can just click on click over here, it will just open a nice looking file for you, hit on connect, and you can just type in your uh, password. Or you can just type in uh, MSTSC and it will just open the remote desktop connection on your Windows PC. It's up to you. So uh, I just click on uh, download remote desktop file and I just decrypt my password. So uh, my password uh, is being saved on the MacBook so I can do that. So I can just click over here, hit connect, type in the password over here, hit OK and I should be able to connect from here. So this is the difference connecting from Mac and the Windows PC. So that's the only difference. Now I'll just take the questions right now. Uh, Rakesh is saying, is the same process uh, for Linux server to connect from Windows system? Uh, no Rakesh, the process is, is different. I'll show the, the Linux as well. The process is different. The launching process is the same, but the connection process is completely different. Uh, for if you're doing for the Windows, you use a PuTTY client, uh, PuTTY client to connect to your Linux machines. Okay, Mozart, you have a question right now. Okay. Yes, Mozart, what's your question? Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir, um, uh, I have created AMI audio RHEL. Can I change to a Windows? My off process is very uh, fine and two two checks is already done. But hmm. uh, you choose Windows and I choose RHEL. Can I change uh -huh. to Win Windows server? Now you can't change to Windows because it's being launched now. It's launched right, right? Okay. This instance uh, is launched. You can't reboot that. You have to. You if it is launched, you have to launch another instance with the Windows one. Okay. Okay. You okay. can you can you can and stop and this. After I stop this instance and I create another Windows server. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Okay. right because RHEL, you have uh, you have uh, selected Red Hat yeah, uh, Linux yes. distribution. Yeah, uh, you have yes. to terminate this instance and uh, choose the Windows Server AMI. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So that's it for connecting the windows. Now, if you just go back to, to your um, dashboard, under the actions, you can just go to actions, or you can just right click, or go to actions, go to instance state. You can stop, reboot, or terminate this instance. To avoid the cost, either stop it or terminate it. I normally terminate it because you can launch the instance anytime. So that's it. Any questions, any doubts? So now we have launched our 
first instance. In our next session, uh, in our next class, on the coming Saturday, we'll see how to launch our Linux instance. The launching process is completely the same, nothing, no difference. It is just that you have to choose another AMI. But the process of connecting to it is, is it's different. If you're using the Mac OS X, you will use this terminal to connect to it. Or you will use the PuTTY client from the Windows. So I'll show you the procedure. In the, in the Windows, we have to get uh, the initial password, whereas for the Linux, we just get the root access. We'll see the, the, the Linux side in our next session. So that's it for today. Any questions, any doubts you have, guys? See, now we have, st we have just started with the, with the practical session. So the assignment for you for this week is that please uh, revise all the concepts, including uh, the AMI, security groups, EBS volumes, and all those kind of things. Launch a Linux instance, launch a Windows instance, see how it works for you. We'll start deep diving in, into more technical concepts from the next week. Right? So please don't complain that, okay, we have just started, because we have just started. Now I have to uh, see uh, the things where we are going you know, on a moderate pace. Okay, so we have to start from scratch, then we go to the intermediate level, then we switch over to the export level. So we have to start it. Okay? So kindly practice, kindly revise the concepts. Even we have uh, discussed very minute things, but they're quite important. Because I've seen, uh, you know, normally it's a human nature. We think we, you know, we aspire for higher things. Okay, we have to discuss the higher concepts. But we forget that we have to discuss the uh, basic concepts first. So in the AWS documentation, I have the I've given you the link for the Google Drive where you can uh, download all these slides. You have uh, the Adrigas content. You have the Adri uh, AWS documentation. Read the entire stuff. Read uh, the the principle of elasticity and scalability. One more assignment for you guys. You have to read a case study. That is called the Any Moto case study. I'll pick any one of the person and ask that what, what he has or what he or she has read in the case study. Any motor, it's called AWS Any Motor Case Study. Any motor is a company. Uh, they're using the Amazon Web Services infrastructure. So don't think that I'm not asking you anyone. I will pick any one of you guys on coming Saturday and ask that what you have read in the case study. Right? So you have two assignments. First assignment is that we have to revise all the concepts that we have discussed in this week. Also, you have to run this entire case study. In this case study, you can also see the video. Going to the case study will not take more than 15 or 20 minutes of your time. Okay? Through the case study, you'll get to know what's the power of elasticity. Uh, it's called Animoto, A-N-I-M-O-T-O. I'm just copying and pasting this link for you. Right. So that's it for today. Any questions, any doubts before we can just wind up? Anything you want to add? So guys, it was just a basic session for this week. I promise for the next week, the things will be harder. I'll deep dive into more crypto concepts, make it a little bit tougher for you. So this, this time was just a basic session. So keep it cool, revise the concepts. The agenda for our next week is, we'll discuss, I'm just writing the topics, you can write it down. The topics that we'll be discussing it would be, hang on one second. Uh, 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 uh. First one, uh, accessing our Linux instances. The second one is uh, we'll discuss the concept of public versus elastic IPs. Then we discuss the concept. Uh, we'll discuss the concept called 
uh, elastic network interfaces. So you can write down the topic so that you can, you can study that before uh, we can uh, start our session. Just an FYI, elastic network interfaces. Then we'll discuss elastic load balancer. Then we'll discuss auto scanning. And, and what we can discuss. Uh, so we'll discuss the load balancer, auto scanning, and if the time permits, if the time permits, I'll start with the CLI, command line interface, if the time permits, because this will be more than enough, but still, if the time permits, we'll discuss the command line interface. These are the six topics that we'll be covering in our next week. And believe me, we'll deep dive in, into more hard sessions now. Okay. So for each uh, for each level the the the, level, the for each session or each week the level will go higher and higher. Okay. So that's it. Anything you want to add? Anything? Uh, any question before we can just we can just end our session? So your assignment is very clear. Rising the concepts and the case study for the animal auto. Okay. So guys, I hope that I'm I'm going fine as per your expectations. If you think I'm going too slow, too fast, or making the things harder, or making the things too much softer, uh, please let me know, right? Because uh, I'll go as per your directions. So if you think that there's something that I need, I can change in my teaching style. You can just you can just let me know. Okay. Uh, Mazar has a question. Yes, Mazar, what's your question? Uh, sir, it's uh, you have not any fast. It is very good for slow. Like okay. That. Okay. Thank you, Mazar. Now, I I just wanted to ensure because uh, sometimes it is fast for some people. That's why I was asking that. No, this uh, say yes, sir, yes, sir. So, I, I'm going fine, right? Yes, sir. All right. Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so that's it, guys. Thank, thank you so much for your time and patience. Have a great week ahead. Enjoy yourself. And uh, please don't forget to revise the concepts. And we'll meet, uh, meet on the coming Saturday. Till then, enjoy yourself. Have a great week ahead. Last but not the least, quite important thing, once the session gets over, please fill in the feedback form. Okay? Because yesterday only uh, three people uh, filled in the feedback form, which is quite discouraging. After the session, we'll get a nice feedback form. Please fill it out. All right? Bye-bye.